compliance, like preparation type of work. So, um, I have a presentation. Can you actually tell me how to share my screen? Do I need to open the sharing? Sure. Tray? And uh, I, I'm being reminded by some, and I just did start start the recording as well. So yeah. for those of you that are on the recording, this is Brandon Hall, um, and uh, he. Yeah, I'll let you introduce yourself really quickly one more time, but this yeah. is uh, August 20th, 2021. And to start your sharing, do you see the big red leave button in the upper right hand corner? Um, are, are you using the web? I'm web using the web. Yeah. Ooh, uh, can you the can sharing you email, tray? Yeah. Can you email your presentation to me really quickly and we will, I'll, I'll, I'll display it here. I'm yeah. not sure if. And maybe somebody out there can correct me if the web version lets you share or not. It, I don't think it does. Yeah, it didn't look like it was going to. Sorry, most of the time I I actually do a tech check the day Sorry. before. But yep. And while oh. uh, while you pull it up, I'll reintroduce myself. So my name my name is Please Brandon. Please leave Hall. your message for five. Oh, <laughs> my name is Brandon Hall. I'm a CPA and managing partner at the Real Estate CPA. Uh, we're a national accounting. Of, we're, we are a national accounting firm. We've got about 20 staff and 600 or so, 700 clients nationwide. We're in every state, uh, and most of our clients are in California. And we help our clients with tax planning, uh, accounting, and tax preparation. But all, all of our clients are in real estate. We work with really small investors and some really large investors, some big funds, um, sort of institutional, but maybe not that not that large. Uh, so we've got a lot of really good experience at the firm. And, and Brandon, I just requested access to the uh, the yeah. document, so you're, you have to approve that before I can show it. Yeah, let me do that. Okay, I shared it with you. Perfect, I got it here. Excellent. And Dan, l l let me ask you this: What's the uh, the relative, I guess, experience level for the folks watching? You know, it, it really varies. There are some people here that are very advanced um, and, you know, run their own side businesses. There are some people here that are brand new. Uh, we have people that are doing single family home rentals, Airbnbs, passive syndications, all of the above. Okay. So it's a, it's a mixed group. Okay. So what I'll do then is I will start with, um, let me do this. Like uh, I don't have anything like that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'll I'll just start with like a really high level overview of why investing in real estate is beneficial, and then we can we can jump into that into some of the slides of that presentation. I think some of them might not necessarily be totally relevant, but that's okay. We could skip around. <clears throat> so, so I think that the the first big thing is why why even invest in real estate, or or, or from a tax perspective. You know what? What's the big deal? I think when you start investing in real estate, or when you start learning about investing in real estate, one of the things that always pops up is, "Oh, it's so tax advantageous. It's so great from a tax perspective." And I think a lot of investors, uh, some investors, get into it purely for tax reasons. And I'm a big fan, even though I, I make money uh, helping people with their tax situation. I'm actually a big fan of not letting the tax tail wag the dog. So, you know, invest in real estate to invest in real estate and build wealth and then reap the tax benefits. Don't invest in real estate purely for the tax benefits. That's kind of my motto. Uh, but it, it, investing in real estate does provide really solid tax benefits. And, and that's you'll often hear about it if you are a new investor, um, especially like during your initial phases of analysis or trying to learn about the different areas or the different types of real estate. Typically, taxes pop up as a benefit to investing in real estate. So at a really high level, the, the main reason that real estate is tax advantageous is because you can increase your income stream without increasing your taxable income. So for example, let's say that I make at my, at my W2 job with the RSUs and everything, maybe I make $250,000. 
And that $250,000, my effective tax rate might be like 23% or something, right? So my marginal tax rate, I might be in the 30s, but my effective tax rate, the total tax that I pay on my total income, what is that ratio? That's the most important thing for tax planning because you know if you're winning or you're losing. Ideally, over time, your effective tax rate goes down, meaning that I might pay $45,000 in taxes on my $250,000 of W-2 earnings. But over time, I want to pay $45,000 in taxes on $300,000 in total earnings. And so now my, my taxes have stayed the same. My earnings have gone up. So my effective tax rate has gone down. My effective tax rate is total tax divided by total income. So what happens with real estate is, is exactly that. I can, I can have a 250K W-2 job. I can buy rental real estate that cash flows and I can avoid paying taxes on the cash flow. And sorry, I actually haven't even gotten to the presentation yet. So it's to, <laughs> I'll tell you next slide whenever, uh, whenever I want to move around. Um, but that's the whole idea with rental real estate, right? So I buy rental real estate. I cash flow $10,000. It's $10,000 that has actually hit my pocket, but I don't have to worry about paying taxes on that $10,000 of earnings. So now I have 250K of W-2 income and an additional $10,000 of rental income, and I'm still paying my same $45,000 in taxes. So my effective tax rate has gone down because my total taxes stayed the same while my W-2 earnings plus my other income has increased. And that's what we want to do. That's why... You know, that famous quote with Warren Buffett about how he pays less taxes than his secretary. Well, he doesn't actually pay less taxes than his secretary. He pays an immensely, an incredibly large amount of taxes. But compared to his total income, that effective tax rate is lower than his secretary's because you can't shelter W-2 income. It's very difficult to do, but you can shelter investment income. You can shelter rental income. So the way that it works, the, the, the sheltering piece is relatively straightforward. Um, it's, you know, I buy a, I buy a piece of real estate, a uh, hundred thousand, let's call it a hundred thousand dollar real estate, uh, single family home. I, I have to net out the cost of land. So maybe my land is $10,000. So I have $90,000 of building on this $100,000 acquisition. And the reason that I have to net out land, it, it, it'll be clear here in a second, but I can't, I can't depreciate land. Land does not deteriorate over time, um, whereas a building does. A building falls apart over time. So I, I figure out what the building value is. I figure out what the land value is. And then I get to depreciate the building value. So in this example, we had $90,000 of building value. In rental real estate, most rental real estate, I depreciate over 27 and a half years. So all that means is that I take that building value, I divide it by 27.5, and every year I get to write that number off. And in this example, $90,000 $90, divided by 27 and a half years is 3,200 bucks. So every single year, I get to take a $3,200 deduction every single year, and that's going to shelter my cash flow. And I get to take that deduction um, regardless of how I pay for the asset. So I can do, I can buy all cash. I could put 0% down. I could do 20% down, 70% down, whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. We're taking the value of the building, which is $90,000 on our $100,000 purchase. We're dividing it by 27 and a half years because that's how long you depreciate rental real estate, most rental real estate. And I get to take that number as an expense against my rental income every single year. So if I bought a $100,000 property, uh, I might put like, I don't know, $30,000 into it. Thir but, but between my down payment and any improvements or anything like that. So I might be $30,000 in. Now, typically you want to hit at least a 10% cash on cash return. So we're talking about 3,600 bucks or so, or $3,000 or so in, uh, in cash flow. But then I get a $3,200 depreciation deduction, which wipes that out from a tax perspective. So I've, I've collected $3,000 in cash flow, actual cash flow for my rental income minus all my expenses. But then my depreciation wipes that out from a tax perspective. So I actually get to tell the IRS in this example that I lost a little bit of money, even though I didn't. I collected $3,000 in, in cash. And that's why rental real estate is so powerful. Because if you can do that 10 more times, now I'm collecting $30,000 in cash and I'm still telling the IRS that I actually lost money. Um, so that's what makes rental real estate so powerful. It's such a great 
it's a great way to build income streams that are tax sheltered. And, and depreciation is simply a, think of it as like, um, <sighs> depreciation is always somewhat challenging to explain, but it's, it's, it's a calculation meant to basically give you like a credit for the deterioration of your property over time. So it's kind of like the IRS's way of saying, or, or really the government's way of saying, thanks so much for investing in US infrastructure and creating a home for US citizens. Uh, we're gonna give you this tax benefit as a result of that. So just whatever your building basis is divided by 27 and a half years, that's your annual depreciation. And that's where the tax benefits are coming from. Now, Brandon, sorry. we've got we've got two questions and I, I apologize. Ahead. I didn't let you know ahead of time. We no, can either do the fine. questions as you go or save them all to the end. Your choice. Let's do them as we go. All right, great. Glenn has a question. He says, isn't the ability to get losses from RE investments blocked at a certain income level? <laughs> that is what we're about to go over. So good question. And uh, ask again if it's not clear in 10 minutes. All right. And Shalendra is asking, can you depreciate your primary home? You cannot depreciate your primary residence unless you're renting a portion of it out. And then there's a whole bunch of rules that you got to follow. But so what we're talking about is rental real estate. So I buy a property, I put a tenant into it, they're paying me, now I can depreciate that. So you do have to place it into service as a rental. Great question, great question. So- And then what, one last okay. question, they're, they're starting to roll in now. That's okay. <laughs> but uh, Philip is asking, depreciation decreases the overall cost basis. How does mm -hmm. the taxes get affected as we depreciate and sell later on? And I. I bet you're going to get into that. We'll talk about that too. Are you in the chat watching the questions? Is that where those? Yeah, and and, and uh, I, I'm happy to watch the questions for you, so you can concentrate on your talk, and I'll, I'll just bring up the ones that are on topic. Totally fine. No, actually, I like watching the questions roll in because it can help me okay. tweak the the presentation as I'm going. But yeah, good. True. All right. So really good questions. So everything that I just talked about, right? Um, can you guys still hear me? I just saw like a symbol pop up. You can still hear me. Yeah, that you muted? I, okay. that's me yeah. muting my screen. Yeah, to make sure. <laughs> you can tell I use Microsoft Teams all day long. Uh, anyway, so uh, I, I'm a Zoom guy, sorry. But uh, so, so the question was about losses, right? Now, before we get into losses, it's really important to understand that, like, like let's take my $100,000 example. I put $30,000 into the property. I get a 10% cash on cash return. Cash on cash return means that whatever my cash flow is divided by the total amount of, of money that I have put into the property. So I put $30,000 in, I get a $70,000 loan uh, or maybe a $65,000 loan and I've got some repairs and stuff, but I got, I've got 30 K of cash into this property. So I take my $3,000 of income, net income after all expenses, net cash flow, sorry, even after mortgage payments, take this $3,000 of net cash flow, Divide that 3,000 by the 30,000 that I put into the property, I've got a 10% cash on cash return. So pretty good property, pretty good investment so far. Now I take this depreciation deduction, and this isn't gonna like work out exactly, but just go with it here. So I take this depreciation deduction of $3,200, right? So I've got a $200 loss. It's a tax loss, not an operating loss. It's not an operating loss because I collected $3,000 of cash. That's cash that has hit my pocket. But thanks to depreciation, I get to tell the IRS that I actually lost $200 because $3,000 hit my pocket. But then I get to tell the IRS I've got a $3,200 depreciation deduction. So I, I'm actually at a loss of $200. And the question is, what do you do with that loss? Because if you can use that loss, now I can take that $200 and offset my other income with it. And now I save an extra 50 bucks in taxes as a result. If I can't take that loss, it becomes suspended and carried forward. And that, that one issue is where we do the bulk of our tax planning for our clients is helping them figure out how to tap into these losses and how to time the recognition of these losses as well. So let's jump to the next slide. Uh, I do, as we're transitioning to the next slide here, there is one question, does the 27 and a half years reset? Yes, it does. So every time that you purchase property, you get a fresh 27 and a half years, even if it's a 200 year old property. Um, so really cool. 
And can you show in Excel the numbers? Hard to follow. Unfortunately, I don't have an Excel prepped, uh, so I do apologize. But it's it's just a I'm just using kind of like random numbers. And um, if you have any questions about like actual numbers, you can certainly certainly ask. But all right, so John, John had a really good question too. How does depreciation work when there's a loan, which means you don't own 100% of the property? There's some, well, you do own 100% of the property, right? So, so you do own 100% of the property. You're just getting financing to own 100% of the property. It's like it's like owning a car. I buy a car. I own 100% of the car. I've just the way that I own it. I've I've borrowed money to own it. Um, so when when you own when you own the asset, you get to depreciate the cost that is allocated to your ownership stake. So if I buy rental real estate. I own 100% of that rental real estate. I get to depreciate 100% of the cost, less the value of land. If I'm in a partnership, maybe we're 50-50 in a partnership, now I can only take 50% of that value, whatever that is. So the loan doesn't impact it. You can 100% finance it. You can 0% finance it. You can 50% finance it. You still get that same depreciation number. <clears throat> okay. Is that me or you? That is apparently me. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. We're, we're, we're cruising. We're cruising. All right. So let's talk about the passive activity rules. Now we're going to get into some tax concepts um, that are really important to real estate investors. So, so we kind of just described, I got this $100,000 property. Uh, $90,000 is allocated to the building. $10,000 is allocated to the land. You can't depreciate land. So ninety thousand dollars divided by twenty seven and a half years is thirty two hundred bucks. So it's thirty two seventy two, but thirty two hundred bucks. Um, I put thirty k into this property to buy it, and and it cash flows three thousand bucks. So pretty good, pretty good return. But since I have thirty two hundred dollars of depreciation, I actually have a two hundred dollar tax loss. What happens to that tax loss? So all rental real estate is considered a passive activity. Any sort of rental real estate that you own is considered a passive activity with the exception of short-term rentals, vacation homes, Airbnbs, VRBOs, that type of thing, which I don't know that we're going to go into today because that's a complex topic. Um, but most rental real estate is going to be considered a passive activity. Passive activities, pa passive losses from passive activities can only offset passive income from passive activities. And the way to think about passive activities is every single dollar that you earn is either passive or non-passive. So there's two buckets for all of your income. It's either passive or non-passive. Every single dollar that you earn, your, your investment portfolio, right? When you cash out your RSUs, your stock options, that's all considered non-passive income for these rules. It's, it's also called portfolio income. So don't get confused with that. For the purposes of, of investing in rental real estate, the important thing to know, all income is either passive or it's non-passive. There's two buckets. So rental real estate is in the passive bucket. And what that means is, so, so Congress back in 1986 set out to stop rich people from investing in rental real estate and using it as a tax shelter. Because what people would do is they would go buy that $100,000 property. And instead of $3,200 of depreciation, they would use techniques called cost segregation studies to accelerate the depreciation that they were able to claim in the first year. So they would claim like $30,000 of depreciation in the first year. And as a result of that, they would get this huge tax deduction uh, just for buying the rental real estate. And so Congress set out to stop that tax loophole from happening. And so they implemented the passive activity rules. So they said, hey, you can still go do that. You can still go buy that rental real estate and you can do the cost segregation study. You can create that $30,000 tax loss, but now it's a passive tax loss. And that passive tax loss can only offset other passive income. Passive income is my rental income. It's any trade or business that I'm invested in where I don't materially participate. And there's a whole bunch of rules around that. But just like, like you could JV with somebody and not materially participate, not do a whole lot aside from bring the money to the table. And that could be a passive activity for you that generates passive income where your rental real estate losses could offset it. So the important thing to remember is that rental real estate is a passive activity. If you create losses, from a passive activity, they can only offset passive income. 
So it's other rental income, that's other businesses that you're passively involved in. If you have passive losses in excess of passive income, those passive losses are suspended and they're carried forward year to year. So you can't claim passive losses against your W-2 income. And that's the big thing. I've got my $250,000 W-2 income. Why can't I use that $200 loss that we just talked about from that rental? Why can't I use that $200 loss against my 250K W-2 income? Well, it's because your $250,000 W-2 income is non-passive. You materially participate in your W-2 job on a day-to-day -day basis. That $200 tax loss from the rental real estate is considered passive. And a passive loss cannot offset non-passive income. But you can recharacterize that passive loss. So if you jump to the next slide, I'll talk about three ways on how you can do that. So the three ways to get around the passive loss rules, because in an ideal world, I can use that $200 tax loss, right? The time value of money theory says a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow, thanks to inflation. Milk costs a dollar today, tomorrow it costs a dollar and one cents. So if I have the dollar and I don't spend it, then tomorrow I can't buy the milk because I still have $1, but now it costs a dollar and one cents. So the inflation erodes my purchasing power as a result, you want to optimize today as much as humanly possible. So this $200 tax loss that we created, I want to claim that tax loss if I can. Sometimes I can't, but if I can structure my facts and circumstances to claim that tax loss against my W-2 income, I want to do that. And there's three ways to do this. So there's three ways to use passive losses or get around these rules that all rental real estate is by default passive. The first way is to simply sell the rental real estate. So if you sell your rental real estate, any loss that has been created and has been carrying forward with that rental real estate will be recognized at the time that you that you sell the rental real estate. Another way to do it is to earn less than $150,000. If you earn less than $150,000, you actively participate in the rental activity and you own at least 10% of the rental activity then you'll qualify for a loss allowance. The loss allowance is a full $25,000 if you earn less than $100,000. But as your earnings increases above 100, that loss allowance actually phases out. And it's completely phased out by the time you hit $150,000. So it's a $25,000 passive loss allowance that you're able to claim if you're earning less than 100K. And that $25,000 loss allowance phases out as your earnings increase above $100,000 and they hit $150,000. So if you're earning $151,000, you can't claim the lost allowance. And if you don't sell your rental real estate, you can't, you can't hit number one. So number one and number two are out for you. So now you're looking at number three. You have to qualify as a real estate professional. And that's where we do a lot of our education and a lot of our consulting with clients is helping them understand how to qualify as a real estate professional, what the rules are, and there's a lot of like misconception around it too. A lot of people think it's really easy to qualify as a real estate professional. It's actually quite difficult. You have to be involved in real estate um, on a very significant basis. But we'll talk a little bit about that on the uh, the next slide here. And as he's as we're transitioning, let's hit some questions. Do you see any that are jumping out at you? Sorry, I was, actually wasn't looking at them. Sure, I wasn't uh, reading them here at the moment too, but I could go down with... Mario is asking, how would depreciation work if, say, home was initially a primary residence and then you decided to rent it out? Yeah, so you're typically going to use your cost basis, your original cost basis. Uh, so if you bought your home like five years ago and it costs 300K and now it's worth 400K, when you put it into service, you're going to use $300,000 as your depreciation cost basis, well, minus the cost of land. So you always have to reduce the cost of land. Kisher is asking, if property values increase, can depreciation be recalculated or does it have to be based off the time of purchase? Great question. It's always based on that, that purchase price. It does not recalculate. Yep. Great All right. Question. And then earnings. Uh, Mario is asking, to be honest, I'm not sure what he's asking here. It says, and the earnings 150K and 100K is passive income, not W into W2 income. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure either. Yeah. Um, oh, I appreciate everybody way. helping everybody out with the calculations and stuff. Yeah. I'm trying to use like round and round numbers and small numbers. Um, 
but thank you for chiming in and, and helping helping others follow along. I appreciate that. Oh, we have no other questions at the moment. <clears throat> cool. Okay, so so rental real estate is by default passive. Passive losses can only offset passive income unless you sell the rental or you earn less than one hundred fifty thousand dollars, or you qualify as a real estate professional. So if we call if we qualify as a real estate professional. Now I can reclassify that $200 loss that I created. Again, owned a $100,000 property, $90,000 is building, $10,000 is land. 90,000 divided by 27 and a half years is my depreciation, roughly $3,200. I cash flowed 3,000 bucks minus my depreciation of 3,200 bucks, $200 tax loss. So I'm at a $200 tax loss. That's a passive loss. Passive losses can only offset passive income. If I don't sell my rental or earn less than 150K or am a real estate professional, that $200 tax loss is suspended and it's carried forward. It's carried forward indefinitely until you die. So you can use it whenever you, or your heirs, I guess, can use it whenever they file that final tax return for you. Not ideal for you, but maybe for your heirs. Um, so let's talk about real estate professional status. So, Cause this is the one big, this is the big one. This is like, th this is, if you qualify as a real estate professional, the tax world opens up to you. And, and I'll give you an example as to how that works. But let's talk about real estate professional status. So I got this $200 tax loss. If I'm not a real estate professional, I can't claim that tax loss. It gets suspended, carried forward. We just talked about why that's not optimal. So real estate professional status allows you to overcome the passive loss rules. It allows you to overcome the presumption that all rental real estate is by default passive. Now, you also have to materially participate. So that's why I say here, real estate professional status in and of itself actually means nothing unless you also materially participate in your rental real estate activity. And we'll talk about what that means. To qualify as a real estate professional, you have to meet two tests. First, you have to spend 750 service hours in a real property trader business in which you materially participate. And that real property trader business can actually be multiple real property trades or businesses. What are real property trades or businesses? There are 11 real property trades or businesses that qualify. A few of those are rental real estate, property management, being a real estate agent or broker, development and redevelopment, so like flipping properties and construction. So those are the main ones that we see. So if you're flipping properties, if you're constructing, if you're, if you're wholesaling, if you're a real estate agent, if you're a landlord, if you're a property manager, those are all real property trades or businesses. You have to spend 750 service hours in all of your real property trades or businesses. So you could be a real estate agent for 400 hours and a landlord for 350 hours, and you will hit the 750 hour test for, for the purposes of this, this slide. So 750 personal service hours in real property trades or businesses in which you materially participate. That's test number one. Test number two, you have to spend more time in a real property trader business than anywhere else. So you have to spend more time in those real property trades or businesses than you do anywhere else. So for everybody on this call, most likely you can't qualify as a real estate professional because you probably spend a lot of time at your W-2 jobs. If you spend 2,000 hours at your, at your W-2 jobs, and if you look at that bullet point, you got to spend more than one half of your service time. What that really means is I have to spend more time in real estate than I do at my W-2 job. So if I spend 2,000 hours in my W-2 job, I have to spend an additional 2,001 hours in real estate, which is going to be really hard to do. But your spouse might be able to meet that test. Maybe your spouse stays at home. Maybe your spouse has a part-time job. Maybe your spouse is a teacher and they get summers off. If your spouse is in a position where they can spend more time in real estate than their job, if they and if they don't have a job, then they can definitely do this. Uh, then your spouse can qualify as a real estate professional. And if your spouse qualifies as a real estate professional, you also qualify as a real estate professional. So only one of you has to do it as long as you're filing joint tax returns. If you file separate tax returns, you have to separately qualify. But if your spouse qualifies for real estate professional status on a joint tax return, you also qualify. So if you can qualify as a real estate professional, if you can spend 750 hours and more time in real estate than you do anywhere else, then you are on track to, uh, to saving a lot of money. But the problem is you also have to materially participate. You have to materially participate in your rental activities. 
And what does that mean? Material participation, there are seven tests to material participation. I'm not going to go into the test for the interest of time. But think of material participation as like, I have to go and actually swing the hammer at my rental property. I have to self-manage my rental properties. And if I can self-manage my rental properties, there's a good chance that I'm going to be materially participating in my rental properties. I might meet the material participation test on the way to satisfying these two tests that you see here. Or I might not because I might be a real estate agent, right? I might hit 750 hours and more time in real estate as a real estate agent. But if I spend zero hours in my rental real estate activities, then my rentals are still passive activities, even if I qualify as a real estate professional. So it's really important to understand that simply qualifying as a real estate professional does not make your rentals non-passive. It doesn't help your rentals avoid these rules. But if I qualify as a real estate professional, and if I also materially participate in my rental real estate activities, now my rentals are non-passive. And non-passive, what that means is that $200 tax loss that we were talking about, I can now use that tax loss to reduce my W-2 income. My W-2 income is, is again in that non-passive bucket. My rental loss by default is in the passive bucket. But if I can qualify as a real estate professional and if I can materially participate in the activity, I can move that $200 tax loss into the non-passive bucket and now I can offset my W-2 income. And you can accelerate this through a cost segregation study. So maybe that $100,000 property, maybe I get a cost segregation study on it. Maybe it yields $30,000, not $300,000, 30000 of first year depreciation. There's things called bonus depreciation and different rules around that. But the important thing to know is I could buy a $100,000 property and get $30,000 of first year depreciation. Well, if my cash flow was 3,000 bucks, now I'm telling the IRS that I have a $27,000 tax loss. If that tax loss is passive, it just gets suspended and carried forward until I can generate passive income in the future or until I sell the rental real estate. But if that $27,000 is non-passive, now it's offsetting my W-2 income, it's reducing the W-2 income and it's going to give me a tax refund because my W-2 income, I'm, I'm withholding taxes. But at the end of the day, when I prepare that tax return, you know, I, I report, yeah, $250,000 of W-2 income minus $27,000 of rental losses. Now I'm going to get a tax refund. Uh, and if I do that multiple times or if I'm buying larger properties, it gets even larger. The numbers get even larger. It's not uncommon for people who do this well to completely eliminate their W-2 and in business income. It's not an uncommon thing. We've helped people do it. We've seen literally $300,000 tax refunds and people get a little nervous and they go, oh my gosh, I've never gotten this big of a refund. Are you sure that this is okay? <laughs> it's like, yes, of course it's okay. Here are all the tax court cases and here's all the success that people have had doing this. So it could certainly not be okay if you do it incorrectly, um, but it's just important to know that rental real estate can really help you uh, accelerate the, the, you can accelerate your tax losses. You can get a lot of money back from the IRS, a lot of those taxes back from the IRS. Now, somebody asked about depreciation in the chat here um, uh, is a while ago. You know, when you depreciate the property, what happens when you sell the property? Well, let's let's use this thirty thousand dollar depreciation example. So I buy I buy a property at a hundred thousand dollars. I do a cost segregation study. I bonus depreciate it, so I get a thirty thousand dollar depreciation allowance in the first year of ownership. Well, starting year two, my basis is now seventy thousand dollars because I had a hundred thousand dollar property, and I reduced it via depreciation by thirty thousand dollars. So now I have a $70,000 property. If in year two, I sell it for $100,000, most people would go, I bought it for a hundred, I sold it for a hundred, so I have $0 of gain. But that's not how real estate works. That's not how ta tax law works. I bought it for a hundred, I depreciated it 30. My basis is now 70. Now I go sell it for a hundred, I have a $30,000 gain. 
because my basis was 70 and I sold it for 100. So there's a spread there that I have to close. And there is a tax called depreciation recapture tax. So you can, you will pay tax on the depreciation that you've claimed. And that's something to watch out for and plan around. And there's ways that you can avoid it. You can use a 1031 exchange to roll your gain forward into the next property. And if you don't know what a 1031 exchange is, I'm not going to go into it in depth. But think of Monopoly. If you played Monopoly growing up, you you buy the four uh, the four houses and then you trade it up for a hotel. That's a 1031 exchange. You're you're selling one property and all that gain that's built into it, you're just going to roll forward into the next property. But you can do that with depreciation recapture as well. So depreciation is great today when I claim depreciation. But when I sell that property later, I have to pay that recapture tax. So I need to be planning around how I'm going to avoid that eventual recapture tax. But the people that do this stuff right save a lot of money in taxes and they save a lot of money in taxes on an ongoing basis. It's, it's typically not like a one and done thing. I mean, they're doing it every single year. So if you're in, if you're in acquisition mode, especially uh, you can save, you can save a lot of money. Now, short-term rentals, I'll, I'll talk about short-term rentals and I actually don't even know if I have a slide on it. I'm kind of just going off, uh, off script here. So I apologize. Um, yeah, I don't even have questions. If you want to now, we've got quite a few bubbling up. Yeah, let me let me let me hit short term rentals for like one minute and then we can hit the questions because I, I do see a lot of great questions. And thank you all for asking questions. So I, I'm I'm happy to help. I, I don't really know. This presentation is more for like um like people that have been in real estate for a little bit. I kind of realized that as we were going through that. So I do apologize, but I hope that this has been a, a helpful presentation nonetheless. Uh so short term rentals. Short term rentals with an average rental period of seven days or less are not subject to the passive activity rules. Or, or sorry, they're not subject to real estate professional status. And what that means is, again, all rental real estate is by default passive. And the way to get around that by default rule is to qualify as a real estate professional, kind of like what we were just talking about, 750 hours, more time in real estate than anywhere else, material participation. But short-term rentals, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit unique. You don't have to qualify as a real estate professional in order to use the tax losses generated from your short-term rentals. You do have to materially participate in the rental activity, which typically means that you have to self-manage the short-term rental. So the point is that you, you don't have to worry about the more than half your time test, which means that you as a W-2 employee, uh, maybe your spouse works too, and you're sitting here going, ah, oh, real estate professional status doesn't apply. This, is, this has been a waste of my 45 minutes. Well, short-term rentals, if you're buying short-term rentals, you can use the same concept that we were just talking about, and you can use it today. You don't have to qualify as a real estate professional in order to claim that. Uh, so if I buy a short-term rental, if I buy an Airbnb property, I go out on the coast and I buy a beach home, I rent it on average seven days or less to tenants, uh, then I don't have to worry about real estate professional status. I do have to self-manage that property. But if I'm self-managing that property, and, and again, you have to hit the material participation test, so don't go and do this without getting a really high qualified advisor that's going to be able to walk you through it and really educate you on it. But if I materially participate, I can have a full-time job. My wife can have a full-time job. I can cost segregate my beach home. I buy a beach home for a million dollars. I cost segregate the beach home. I get a $300,000 first year bonus depreciation deduction. That's going to create a $280,000 tax loss. And that tax loss, if I materially participate in my short-term rental, can directly offset my W-2 income, my stock sale income, any other type of income that I'm earning, because it will be in the non-passive bucket. Again, two buckets, passive, non-passive, short-term rentals. If I materially participate, it lands in that non-passive bucket. You don't have to qualify as a real estate professional to shift it, which just means that my W-2 income, my business income, everything else that's in the non-passive bucket can be offset by the tax losses that I create from buying that rent, that, that vacation home. And if you think about it, it just, it reduces your risk of buying a vacation home. You get a $280,000 tax loss on a million dollar property. Maybe you're earning $300,000, but $280,000 tax loss just saved you, gosh, uh, $90,000 in taxes almost. So it, uh, it really helps um, reduce risk. And, and that's what we, it's another thing that we uh, do a lot of planning around for our clients.
So let's uh, let's jump to questions. Do you have a few a few good ones? Here yeah. That we can... Tarek is asking, what other sources of passive income are there? Does stock investment qualify? Great question. So for the purposes of these rules, stock, uh, stock income, dividends, interest, uh, gain from selling stock is all considered non-passive. So it's all in that non-passive bucket. The only thing that's going to be in the passive bucket is rental real estate and any trader business that you're invested in as a partner, not like a corporation, but as a partner uh, where you're receiving some profit share, but you're not doing anything. So think of like like maybe you go down the street and you invest in your local hair salon. You, you give them $50,000, they're going to expand. And as a result, you get a 5% stake. And that 5% stake gives you $5,000 a year profit split. Well, if you're just giving them money and you're not doing anything operating wise, that $5,000 that you earn every single year, that's passive income because you're not materially participating in that business. You're just a passive partner. So that passive income can be offset by your rental losses. So important to know that like, like a lot of uh, CPAs make the mistake thinking that my rental losses can only offset rental income, but they don't realize that passive income is passive income. I can invest in any type of business, as long as it's not a C corporation, any type of business, earn profits and not materially participate. That's passive income. My rental losses can offset it. All right, P Pompey is asking, or, or Pompey is asking, uh, can my spouse and I, uh, can our time be added together to qualify for real estate professional status? Excellent question. For real estate professional status, for the purposes of the 750 test and the more than half your time test, one spouse has to qualify separately. But for the material participation piece, that's phase two, right? Phase one is qualify as real estate professional. Phase two is materially participate. Phase two, that material participation, you can combine spouse time. And why? How, how would that be beneficial? Well, maybe your spouse loves being a real estate agent, but really doesn't like managing rentals. Well, if they're a real estate agent for 1,500 hours, they're going to hit the 750 hour test and they're going to hit the more than half the time test. And then you could go manage the properties and they could never touch it. Well, spouse is a real estate professional. You materially participate, so spouse gets to count your time. So spouse is a real estate professional and spouse materially participated in the rental portfolio. So for real estate professional status, you got to do it alone. But for material participation, you can you can combine time. So you know, short-term rentals, that whole thing I was just talking about, mater that's material participation. There's no real estate professional status there. So you can combine spouse time for material participation for short-term rentals. All right, Dennis is asking, um, can I use RE cost segregation losses to offset capital gains, short term or long term? Yes. So your cost segregation so, so when you create when you have a so cost segregation study is the practice of basically saying, you know, I've got this hundred thousand dollar property that I just bought, and but like, and, and we did the allocation ninety thousand dollar to building and ten thousand dollar to land, but there's a bunch of components that make up this $90,000 building. And all of those components are not going to last 27 and a half years. So a cost segregation study basically goes through and identifies all of the components that make up this $90,000 building. And it, it, it gives you a different depreciation schedule and it lets you do it faster. That's why you can write off so much in the first year. But it's really important to, to understand that a cost, all a cost segregation study does is it's going to increase the depreciation that you are allowed to claim in the first few years of ownership. And that depreciation is an expense that reduces or creates a tax loss. It reduces your income from the rental property or it, it reduces it so much that it creates a loss on that rental property. That loss is passive by default and you have to qualify as a real estate professional and materially participate to make it non-passive. So it depends on what type of gains you're talking about. Like, like if you ask me, I've got um, this other rental property that I'm selling at a gain. Can that gain be offset by the rental property that I'm that I'm running a cost segregation study on? Yes, it can. But if you're telling me, hey, I'm selling like, I don't know, um, I almost said Apple stock, but that's probably not very kosher in, in, uh, on, this <laughs> on this presentation, right? Let's say I'm selling Disney stock at a gain. Uh, that is non-passive income. So I can't take my rental losses and offset it unless I qualify as a real estate professional and materially participate. 
All right. Um, Bob is asking, how do you log your hours when you're trying to qualify for real estate professional status? Excellent question. So you do have to log your hours. You have to log every single hour. You have to put the date, the time, the the purpose of the, what the task was, the purpose of it, who was there. Uh, we have a time log that like our clients use and stuff. And there's things that you can find online. But the point is, is to like, like just kind of track time, track time on an ongoing basis. And the way that I like to explain to folks to think about it is, you know, five years from now, if the IRS is asking you questions about it, you're able to very quickly reflect and say, oh yeah, I, I was at the rental doing this repair. And I remember that repair because I have this great note about it. Um, that will stop the, the ongoing questions from an auditor. So keep really good notes. So date, amount of time, what the task was, the purpose of it, any notes about it that'll refresh your memory will be good. And Jane is asking kind of a follow-up question. Does this in increase your chances of being audited? So to my knowledge, it does not increase your chances of getting audited. Um, and, uh, you know, from my experience, we've been doing this for six years. And the only audits that we've helped people with with real estate professional status are those that are coming to us that need help. So our clients haven't been audited on this as they've been our clients. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any like data or statistics that says that this is going to increase your audit chances. I mean, we, we tell clients to prepare for an audit. So I don't want clients doing this and not preparing for an audit. So making sure that you keep that time log, making sure that you have documents that support this, uh, making sure that you're listening to us and, you know, along the way we're holding you accountable to it. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps. All right. And then Philip is asking uh, if I'm sorry, James is asking, how is rental forgiveness impacting landlords? What tax relief benefits are there for landlords? Um, to my knowledge, there's no there's no tax benefits at this point to for any of the federal programs uh, for landlords. There are funds that have been created but have not been uh, very efficiently executed. So there's a lot of landlords that haven't gotten paid out, um, even though they qualify for the. Um, uh, it's not even though they qualify for the government funding, they're they're not getting it. So, so I don't know, will that change? Maybe, but right now there's no, there's nothing for landlords uh, aside from these, these funds that have been created to, to help cover some rents that apparently are not being executed very well. Um, I, now, if, if somebody's not paying your rent, so some people at, will ask like, well, if I'm not getting the rent, if I'm renting for a thousand bucks, but I've got a tenant in there and they're not paying me rent, where do I deduct my thousand dollar loss? Uh, and you don't, you don't get the deduct a thousand dollar loss. You just don't report the income of a thousand dollars. So you just have expenses instead of income. And that's how, that's how that works. Do you, do you have your contact information on a slide that I could skip to just to, uh, yeah, have it's it the there? last one. Last yeah, one. Okay. Last one. Yeah. All right. And then Philip is asking a good question here. If you have multiple properties with carried over loss, then would that carried loss be something you can offset depreciation recapture? with at the uh, sale of the property. Absolutely. Now we're talking. Now now we're talking some strategy, right? So yes, definitely. And and there's all there's all sorts of fun timing stuff. If you go to uh if you go to slide uh 14, that's where my contact info is. Um yeah, so so if you are uh if if you're investing in real estate, it's it's not like a bad thing if you create these big suspended passive losses because you can you can sell property and those suspended passive losses will be unlocked to offset the gain, which includes depreciation recapture. Uh, you don't have to do a 1031 exchange, which is cool. You know, like like everybody talks about how great 1031 exchanges are, and I, I think they're great. Uh, but you know, if you've got, we've had we've we've literally had clients before that they're like new clients that come to us and like yeah, I'm in the middle of a 1031 exchange. We look at their tax returns and we go, well, you know, you're, you're carrying forward a four hundred thousand dollar tax loss. Are you sure that you want to do a 1031 exchange? They're like, oh, nobody told me I was carrying forward a four hundred thousand dollar tax loss. So, you know, if you're carrying forward these losses, they can offset the gain and just make your life a little simpler. Not to say that you shouldn't do a 1031 because I, I I love 1031s. Um, so yeah, definitely. And and somebody asked about syndications. I saw it somewhere in there. A, a real estate syndication is like like if I went and wanted to buy a ten million dollar apartment building. I'm not going to be able to, you know, rate to to put three million dollars of my own money down, and I probably wouldn't want to do that anyway because that's way too much risk in one big asset. But 
what I would do is I would go and say, okay, I'm going to get this $10 million building under contract. And then I'm going to go raise the $3 million from my friends and family and network. That's a syndication. So I'm pooling money. I'm pooling investor money. And then what I would do is I would do a cost segregation study on that $10 million, uh, that $10 million asset, probably get a two hundred, a $2.5 million tax loss. And I'm going to pass that tax loss back to my investors. So in that example, if I put $100,000 into the deal, I'm probably going to get an $80,000 or so tax loss passed back to me in the first year as a result of the cost seg study and the passive losses and, and all that stuff. That $80,000 tax loss is passive and that can offset my rental income or the gain on sale for my other rental activity and things like that. So we can do some different timing things there as well, uh, especially if you're into the syndication space and you don't mind being a limited partner in some of these different deals that are out there. Um, so that that's that's kind of cool too from a from a tax perspective. All right, I'm going to try and hit as many questions as we can in the last two minutes here. Um, but Ashish is asking for STRs. Can you write off the principal portion of the mortgage payment as part of your expense? Great question. So STRs mean short-term rentals, and uh, so they, yeah, I, I like that you use the uh, the acronym there. But yes, yeah, short-term rentals. Um, and the principal portion of the mortgage payment can never be written off ever, regardless of what type of loan it is. It, it, it can be a car loan. It can be a business loan. It can be a long-term rental loan. It can be a short-term rental loan. The principal portion is treated from a tax perspective as moving from like your, your left pocket into your right pocket. So it's technically still your money. It's just locked up in the property at that point because it's still your money. You didn't actually lose it. It's not an expense. All right. Muhammad is asking, can can I and my wife both have 750 hours in total to qualify as a, a real estate professional? I think that that was kind we, of on. Yeah, I think that was on that other question. So you, you, you or your spouse have to qualify. One of you has to qualify alone for the 750 hours and more than half your time test. But you can collectively qualify for the material participation test. All right. Claudine is asking, does an online business, is it, does it count as passive income? Maybe. It depends. Uh, there, there are, there are you, you have to look at the material participation tests. There are seven of them. And if you don't pass any of those seven, then you have a passive activity. Uh, most of the folks that we have that are running like e-commerce stores or some online, you know, uh, info businesses or something like that, most of them are materially participating. They will meet one of those seven tests. So I'm going to conservatively say that that's probably not passive, even though it might feel passive. It's probably not passive in the eyes of tax law. <laughs> Did I lose you? Oh, sorry. I'm speaking on mute. No worries. One last question, and we are at one o'clock. So if you have to drop, go ahead. We will be back here next week. But John is asking if I have, and, and actually, you know what? Before you guys drop, why don't you take yourselves off mute and just thank Brandon uh, for his time here? <laughs> thank you, Brandon. Thanks, I appreciate Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. That's cool. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. Thanks. Very helpful. All right. And then one last question here. John is asking, if I have a rental property overseas in another country, will that qualify for U.S. tax purposes? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The rules are a little bit different, but yeah, you can report it on your Schedule E and take depreciation and do all sorts of fun stuff. All right, everybody. Have a great weekend. Brandon, thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Thanks, Dan. Hey, Dan, I think you can stop recording, by the way. Yeah, I'm just making sure that I, I get everything. Oh, gotcha. Before I do that. <laughs>